So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of CSIR ISBT and my own behalf, I welcome you all. Today, we are here to celebrate the National Technology Day. We begin our program with institutional song, which conveys the vision, mission, and outcome of our institute. May I request all of you to please stand up for the introduction. Thank you very much. Now I would briefly talk about National Technology Day. National Technology Day is celebrated every year on 11th May to highlight the achievements of scientists, researchers, engineers, all other involved in the field of science and technology. It is also a symbol of quest for technological creativity and scientific empowerment for integration of society and industry with the science and technology. The day commemorates India's victoriously test-fired nuclear missile at the Pokhran in 1998 and become the world's sixth atomic state. It is a day to remind Indians about the technological advancement made by the country. For this year, the theme of National Technology Day is Science and Technology for a Sustainable Future. For taking the program further, now I invite our director, sir, for his welcome address, please. Sir, you are on mute. Very good morning, uh, Professor Dr. Kuldeep Singh who is director at the ICAR, National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, New Delhi. Professor Shyam Kumar Sharma, who is honorary professor and former VC at CSK SPKV, Palampur, and also former director of ICAR, National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, New Delhi. I could see Dr. Rana, other distinguished guests, our superannuated scientists and staff, member of CSIR, IPT staff and their family members, friends from press and media. On behalf of the Institute and on my own behalf, I am deeply honored to welcome you all on National Technology Day celebrations that we are organizing today in our Institute. 
today we have two illustrious illustrious personalities amongst us to address during the occasion uh, in fact uh, professor singh apart from all his achievement which my uh, other colleague will detail about his cv but i must tell you he is a very dear friend to our institute and uh, he is the person who helped us on several occasions whether it was import of genetic resources of heeing saffron monk fruit or hippophy and you talk of a genetic material and he ensures that whatever we get in this country that is safe and we can use it very safely and with full confidence so thank you so much professor singh for kindly agreeing for today's uh, function we are really grateful uh, then we have today amongst us professor s k sharma ji uh, who again has been a very dear well wisher of our institute for so many years and uh, he is also member of our research council and uh, he is our elders and who keeps on guiding us on various issues he and he ensures that institute progresses through various ways he he has his own ways to ensure progress of our institute so we are so grateful to you also sir that you kindly agreed for today's occasion which is so pertinent today and uh, i must tell you that visit of both of you is due to our institute and i am sure that covid situation will be under control after a while and we look forward to your visit again uh, this time it was virtual next time it will be real so we have to see how much time we have to see look for to fill up this gap between our virtuality to a reality and uh, you know in the present time when covid 19 is trying to rule all over humanity we we'll all our realizing the importance importance of this technology which is helping us uh, preventing the spread of the virus educate the people warn the ma masses empower those on the ground to be aware of the situation and noticeably lessen the impact i think that's what i would see what this technology uh, is doing and if you see today we are using all sorts of technology whether mobile cloud analytics robotics artificial intelligence uh, you name it technology that we are using high speed internet and then now because because of all these technologies it is now possible for us to address this pandemic response whether we talk of uh, fighting the misinformation on covid whether we are fighting finding new drugs for the treatment of covid you talk of a thing and we are or you know technology is helping us a lot in this direction and uh, you know from the last year this covid uh became a very burning issue and uh, it was a time when country needed the science and the scientists the most and uh, this was the time and i must i am very happy to share with you that our scientist uh, narendra vishal tripode and his team consisting of arvind ashish sharad varun navin sahdev suresh priti anu lal chand pradeep they have initiated and extended the covid testing for our people in himachal pradesh and i think uh, uh, this is a great job and service as a scientist they they are doing and then team is and very important thing you know apart from this core team our team is supported by volunteers a uh, lot of volunteers our own students like um, uh, anish uh, the he is our technical staff vijay our post doc ambika our student narendra our student ravi our student navin our student sahib our student and so many students are actually helping in this testing and at the back the team is supported by our scientists like vipin dharam singh arun shashi and so many others so we are getting support from several people for this covid testing and whenever this crisis arises our team get support from each and every scientist and uh, it's a tireless effort of our dedicated team which deserves much applause had it been a, in the auditorium i think all of us have given the applaud to the team but they need much applause uh, for for this particular job and i feel that this our team is becoming a role model to inspire others to serve the society in time of need that's what we strongly believe uh, apart from that i must also tell you although it was a covid period but during that 2021 since it's a technology day so i thought i'll briefly tell you that during that year we totally signed 117 mous 
and out of that 117 MOUs, there were 25 technology transfers, six consultancies, 39 material transfers, and then there were around 20 incubators and startups. And that's a major uh, activity in our institute. And 27 were miscellaneous um, MOUs that we signed. So basically, if you see, if you say that we signed 117 MOUs, how many people we have empowered through our technologies? And just to give you some brief that what sort of technologies we have transferred during past uh, year. For example, you know, zinc and iron and also the protein deficiency. These were very important issues, particularly for nutritious and the healthy food and that too under this COVID environment. And I am happy to tell you, we transferred the process and technology for manufacturing of spirulina based peanut bar to two, three companies uh, last year. And uh, for multigrain powder also, we transferred this company, this technology to two persons. Then also for hand sanitizer, you know, it is based on tea. People can say that what is their great in the hand sanitizer. But I tell you, we compared the performances of various hand sanitizer available in the market and what we manufactured and what was available, you can see the difference. I think um, as they say that taste is in tasting the pudding. So that, that's what uh, this th simple things like hand sanitizers are. Then apart from other things, uh, you know, some important uh, technologies, for example, uh, we work on um, microbiology of uh, waste degradation and for that efficient cyclotrophic bacterial formulation for degrading the masses uh, that was transferred and also people in Ladakh, Lahore and Spiti, they are using our technology to take care of night soil. And very recently we are in very advanced talk with army also in Ladakh region to tackle this particular problem. And also we are making this enriched compost and vermi compost to degrade there apart from night soil, also the other waste management issues. We are tackling them. Then, you know, tea is a very interesting pro uh, produce and we make so many things out of tea. Last time we transferred technology of tea-based vinegar and this vinegar has a property that it, uh, you know, uh, lessens the fat deposition in the body. So this tea vinegar is a very new product which came uh, out of our institute. Then certainly ready to eat uh, chemical and preservative free food. It's already there in the market. Then this time we needed some herbal soaps and liquid washes and incense cones which do not use any chemical and which are totally, totally natural. Can you believe a soap which does not have SDS, SLS or any such chemical? So we have developed those technologies because nowadays hand washing has become uh, a real issue. Then we, you know, this heing and saffron, these tech, for these technologies, we signed MOU with Directorate of Agriculture. And now we are in the process of signing this. I think we already have any, already, I think, signed that MOU with JNK and other places who are interested in heing. In Ladakh also, we transferred some of the plants of heing. So we are ensuring that, you know, whatever genetic material that we receive, that we test in our institute, we transfer to the people. Uh, one technology I would like to say that which we did at a very large scale, and that was on shiitake mushroom technology. And here the shiitake mushroom advantage of this technology was that you can have the vitamin D into it, particularly vitamin D2. And now this technology takes only two months compared to one year for other technologies. And with the help of MSME, more than 750 people are associated with this technology. And this technology is in the hands of the people in Uttarakhand. It is in the hands of people in Sikkim, in Northeast, so many places and also nowadays in Himachal Pradesh. So we try to we spread this technology throughout the nation right from northeast to Uttarakhand to Himalayan, uh, our uh, own Himachal Pradesh. And two, three special things I would like to mention. You know, as we age, uh, our knee start getting some problem. And now we developed a technology for improvement of cartilage health. And this te technology also we transferred this year. We also transferred the technology for modulation of immunity. 
and uh, this is a fantastic i would say uh, solution which really improves uh, immunity a lot which we have tested so well in our lab and with all data on cytokine storm and all those sort of stuff and this technology has gone to a um, punjab based firm which is in the process of now making um, and taking it forward actually in new delhi they have a office and they are taking it forward and then uh, uh, aeroponics things like aeroponics and hydroponics and particularly for plant production you know for example kutki or picuriza curva jata mansi they take several years before one can harvest the produce and using our this technology uh, rather than two years one can have the crop just in 3 to 4 months so, so we have developed some uh, those technological innovations so what my point uh, is that we develop a range of technologies and whatever we develop it did not limit to the lab rather it went to the people's hand and that's what we want that you know any technology whenever moment it is ready we try not to wait at all and we take it to the field so 25 or 26 different people you know technologies were transferred and several entrepreneurs you know one technology went not only to one person but some technology to five persons some technologies to eight persons so several people are associated with our technologies so this was something on the technology front and second thing i would also like to highlight you know agro technology is yet important issue and i must tell you that this time uh, you know more than um, uh, 1300 farmers for uh, uh, particularly for stevia cultivation for wild marigold cultivation and processing whenever we give technology we never give half baked technology if we give technology for cultivation we also ensure processing as well and because of that as you must be aware himachal pradesh has become number one state in the country in terms of production of the wild marigold oil and you know our uh, buyers they come and give the money in advance for purchase of this wild marigold oil because now now they know it that himachal pradesh is the destination for some such crops i must tell you that this year we develop entrepreneurship around things like buckwheat Uh, because uh, professor singh is giving a talk on agro biodiversity so i thought i will touch this issue also that uh, buckwheat is a very important crop i i need not to highlight the importance that is a gluten free and so many advantages it does but our scientists what they did they developed a range of product we were surprised you know its leaves can be used and its grain can be used so we have a startup in our institute who is developing at least three products out of this buckwheat and he will be taking it forward and moving ahead in the area of agro technologies i must tell you that uh, this year we launched a floriculture mission and uh, here our target is to empower around 1500 farmers and that will bring around 400 hectare area under floriculture and in the process will be developing nine varieties too and importantly you know this time this technology will not only be limited to farmers but school and colleges will also be integrated so that you know uh, people have some uh, initial start for learning and loving the biodiversity the plants what they have all around so schools and colleges will be integrated and apiculture will be an integral part of this mission so these are some of the important things i thought uh, during my welcome address i must tell our audience and also our honored speakers that what we are doing and apart from that two things i would also like to mention one is that we have moved little bit towards textile direction also why because we know that plants are rich source of cellulose and cotton is certainly one way by which you get the very pure cellulose in terms of cotton that we get but the fact is if you see here plants which have very less lignin we identified some of those plants and we developed technology of isolation of cellulose converting them into the yarn so that we can integrate ourselves to the textile mission also even today if we analyze the data 
lot of tons and tons of cotton and cellulose is imported in our country in spite of we being rich a biodiverse rich country so we went little bit towards textile side also so our as i told you the our job is to develop technologies that can boost bioeconomy through sustainable utilization of bio resources and our institute is moving in that direction and with this small introduction i once again welcome all of you and we look forward uh, for the uh, presentation by our speakers and we move forward and before that uh, i request my colleague uh, dr vipin hallan to introduce our guests although i must tell you that sir both of you are such personalities who do not need any introduction but i still feel our young students who are associated and who are attached with our today's function i think they must uh, those people who are not aware for them i think it would be useful so can i request vipin to please uh, introduce our honored guest today thank you very much sir uh, respected director sir academicians from palampur and far off places scholars entrepreneurs tea planters our former colleagues ladies and gentlemen we are fortunate to have amongst us professor kuldeep singh and professor sk sharma and it is my proud privilege to introduce the honored guest today one by one on behalf of the institute professor kuldeep singh a renowned scientist who is the chief guest of today's function will be delivering the national technology day lecture professor singh is currently director at icr national bureau of plant genetic resources new delhi since august 2016 He joined as eighth regular director of the institute. He received his master's and PhD degree in plant breeding from Punjab Agricultural University, Ludhiana, and is recipient of Sardar Iqbal Singh Gold Medal. Professor Singh worked as molecular genetist, senior molecular genetist, and director at the School of Agricultural Biotechnology, PAU, Ludhiana. He has contributed immensely towards improvement of rice and wheat. During his tenure at PAU. He was associated with development and release of three wheat varieties and establishment of basic genetic material and protocols for development of wheat haploids. Notably, as postdoc at International Rice Research Institute, Philippines, he was instrumental in developing a complete series of secondary trisomics in rice, which laid the foundation for generating correct physical map of rice and the rice sequence genome sequence. He was also actively involved in wide hybridization in wheat and rice gene identification and mapping those genes conferring resistance to bacterial blight blast brown plant hopper sheep blight in rice novel gene conferring resistance to stripe rust leaf rust cereal cyst nematode kernel bunt and powdery mildew in wheat and molecular breeding through marker resistant selection in rice With his efforts and work, the organization so far has released ten varieties in rice that are occupying more than seventy percent area in Punjab, and he has identified several new genes in rice and wheat which confer resistance to diseases, insects, nutritional and productivity traits. Professor Singh has led the successful sequencing of chromosome two A of wheat from India under international collaboration with uh, Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium, which has opened up new avenues in wheat improvement. the reference sequence of wheat which was published in the journal science he has more than 280 research publications which includes 116 peer reviewed international journals such as science pnas genetics stack crop science molecular breeding to state a few he has guided 14 msc and 14 phd students and four of them were recipients of monsanto beechel uh, borlaug international scholarships In addition he has been member of advisory committee for more than 80 post graduate students Professor Singh is member of more than 20 national and international scientific committees of several institutes including Asia chair for Bureau of International Treaty for Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture Rome and chair for GLIS He is also a recipient of the Borlaug Global Rust Initiative Gene Stewardship Award and Sci Genome Research Foundation Excellence in Science Award, sir. We are very much looking forward to your to hear your thoughts. Now, a brief introduction about Professor Shyam Kumar Sharma, who is presiding over this function today. 
He is honorary professor and former vice chancellor CSK HPK Vipalampur and former director ICR National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources. Professor Sharma received his MSc and PhD in genetics from the Indian uh, Agriculture Research Institute, New Delhi. And he is an alumni of ICR CPRI Shimla and CSK HPKV, where he was program director, Advanced Center of Hill Bioresources and Biotechnology, and Dean, College of Basic Sciences, before joining as director, ICR NBPGR. And later he was appointed as vice chancellor of CSK HPKV, Palampur. After superannuation, he continues his scientific pursuits as CSIR Emeritus Scientist in the CSIR Institute of Himalayan Biosource Technology. Now, during 2018, he was appointed honorary professor by the Himachal Pradesh Agriculture University, Palampur. He combines in him a range of expertise, a teacher, researcher, and institutional leader with academic background in genetics, crop improvement, biotechnology, and plant genetic resource management. He has guided and supervised 12 postgraduate students. He has won several national and international fellowships and awards during his career spanning over 40 years, like Commonwealth Postdoctoral and Academic Star Fellowship, Marie Curie European Commission Fellowship, Royal Society, and INSA International Collaborated Award in Johnson Center, Norwich, to state a few. He has published more than 175 peer-reviewed research publications to his credit in addition to books, monographs, popular articles, reviews, and book chapters. He has been office bearer and member of several national, international, professional bodies. He has chaired several committees and networks such as capacity building and regional collaboration for enhancing the conservation and sustainable use of plant genetic resources in Asia, Thailand. He is also chairing the South Asia Network in Plant Genetic Resources, New Delhi, and he has been member of several academic and steering committees. He was also actively involved associated with the United Nations Intergovernment Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services as coordinating lead author for Asia-Pacific Region Assessment on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Tokyo, Japan during 2015 to 2018. Currently, he is chair of the Technical Advisory Committee UN Environment GEF project being executed by Biodiversity International India office. Sir, we are looking forward, very keenly looking forward to your address. Now, with this uh, brief introduction, may I request Professor Kuldeep Singh, Chief Guest of today's function, to please deliver the National Technology Day Lecture on Conservation of Agrodiversity for Ensuring Food and Nutritional Security in India. Sir, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Vipin. Professor Sanjay Kumar, Director, IHPT. Professor S.K. Sharma, former Vice Chancellor, HPKV, and the former Director and VPGR. In fact, whatever I'll be speaking is the base, the foundation they have laid, and we are building on that one. Others, faculty of IHBT and students. First of all, thank you very much, sir, for giving me this opportunity to be with you this afternoon and this morning. In fact, I would have loved to be a partly there, but uh, we all know the situation, what happened, and uh, but still, technology has made it possible for us to really uh, have this sort of lecture as well. Uh, so let me share my presentation. Is it visible now? Yes. 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 Good. good. Fine. So what I did is realizing that there will be a good number of students uh, also in this uh, uh, lecture. I kept it a little bit more fundamental as well, which may be too basic for many of you, but. Uh, I do understand that our students are not exposed to many such things in the undergraduate as well as in some of postgraduate courses. The reason is the number of disciplines have increased over time. The time of degrees we are shortening, and I think that has made a lot of difference now. That's why I kept a few things on the fundamental. Also, 
to share the young generation at the moment that uh, last three to four weeks, we are seeing that a little bit lower stock of our oxygen, how bad impact had it on the nation? And how are we striving for that? Imagine if countries like India have food deficient of 5% or 10% any year. Believe me, it can shake the global markets. Those who are familiar with what happened in 2008, when the food prices everywhere in the world were on an uphill, India could manage containing its food prices to almost zero level of inflation. That was possible because of the development in agriculture in India, and that it had happened because of one agency, it happened because of the farmers, because of the scientists, because of the policy makers, because of development in marketing, all of them. And as a result, we have a buffer stock, which is pretty almost what our economists say, three times than what we require. But at the same time, if you read the top class economists of the country who say that 25 to 30 million tons is sufficient for us in the buffer stock, and the same people, as you read them, they say that from March 2020 until September 2020, this was six months' time, the country consumed around 25 million tons of food grains. So we have to be very, very careful, and that's why I chose this word, this title, Conservation of Agrobiodiversity, for ensuring food and nutritional security. We have been successful in ensuring the food security so far, but for nutritional security, our figures are very discouraging, disheartening. Right now, Dr. Sanjay Kumar also told about iron and zinc deficiencies, vitamin A deficiency in the population. <coughs> Sorry. Almost 70% of our rural women are anemic because of iron deficiency. <coughs> Almost 45% of our children below the age of five are facing protein malnourishment. And all these result into stunting and wasting. And if you all see the recent data, what our National Family Health Survey has released, we are not improving at all. The percentage of the population who still are wasted or stunted is around 40%. So these are some of the challenges and I will share you some more challenges what we are facing either at the national level or the global level. Until and unless we realize, we acknowledge the challenge, we may not be able to find the solutions. And this being a National Technology Day, and developments in agriculture didn't happen without the use of technology. There were several developments in last five or six decades that actually led to improvement in agriculture as well. And I'll be taking a very small part of that. That's the conservation of the agrobiodiversity. Uh, just to define what agrobiodiversity will mean, because we will be limiting ourselves accordingly. And this is a very simple definition. Means the components of biological diversity, including their wild forms, that are important for agriculture. These may be in nature, 
We might have collected them, we might have developed them, and we might be maintaining them for the purpose of food, fodder, fiber, fuel, health, and nutrition security. And I highlighted health specifically because U.S. Institute has a primary mandate for health as well. So agrobiodiversity will include for all of them. So looking at the global scenario or the evolutionary mechanical world, you say, in fact, nature had provided us a large diversity in crops to fulfill all the requirements of the human beings, be it for food, fiber, fuel, medicinal aesthetics. And in fact, synergistic coexistence was going on prior to industrialization and scientific exploitations. We now see a huge loss of this diversity happening. And part of that may be because of the human greed. We must look into that one as well. A simple example to tell you why I am saying that we lost a lot of biodiversity. 20 or 30 or 40 years back, if you look at a typical farmer in the hill agriculture, you'll find 20, 25 crops growing on one's farm. Now you are in Himachal now. You can see it's going almost a monoculture. I, I visited Spiti Valley two years back and it's almost 100% apple. See the Lahal Valley going the same way. You have the Kulu and Manali Valley almost 100% apples. And a few cash crops, the vegetables. But they will have a negative impact. These will be giving us more financial resources, more money. But that money is not going back to improve our health, actually. This is something which has happened, which has happened. And in fact, this slide I have taken from Biosity International. The question is when we're talking of agrobiodiversity, we need to have a major of that one. Until we have a major, we won't be able to compare. We won't be able to know where we stand. Do we need to improve it or is it okay with us? And in fact, the agrobiodiversity index is one such thing which is in its formative stage still. That's going on. Many people are working on to it how to develop an agrobiodiversity index that will help us. And in fact, this agrobiodiversity index is dependent on three pillars. And these are, I go from here, it's an agrobiodiversity in markets and the consumption. Now, we will be healthy only if we are eating diverse foods. And diverse foods in the market will be available only if there is a diversity in production. And when I say agrobiodiversity, this includes everything. Animals, plants, fungi, whatever it is. And for the production, for having the sustainable production, we really need a diversity in the genetic resources. So these are three very important areas. But until now, we have been working with these three areas independently, not knowing each other what's happening. And this has been realized now. And some of you may be aware that UN is going to have a summit on what's called as food systems, a summit on food systems that will be held somewhere in November this year. That's what we have realized. And in fact, COVID has given us something that way. We have realized that for having a good immunity, you need a good diet. You need a balanced diet, you need a diverse diet. And these things will happen only if you have diversity, again, at the three places. You need the diversity in your markets, as in your plate. 
you need the diversity at the farmer's fields, and you need the diversity in the genetic resources. And I will present in the pictorial form here. These are the indicators of diversity. If you are growing a large number of crops, this is what is required. And within when you are growing one crop, you also need diversity within a crop to have the sustainability. Otherwise, we may risk if we have one or two varieties growing on a larger area, we may have we may face any of the uh, epidemics as we are facing in COVID right now. And I have no hesitation in saying that commercialization is the biggest threat to biodiversity. There are several ways, several reasons which are really decreasing the biodiversity, but there are several institutions which are working towards improving the biodiversity. And these may be sustainable developmental goals, these may be IT targets, these may be national biodiversity targets, and an Agrobiodiversity Congress was held, the first Agrobiodiversity Congress was held in India in 2016, and that led, culminated into a declaration, what's called as the Heli Declaration. So these, all the things, they really help us in promoting or conserving the agrobiodiversity. But here I will be discussing or uh, focusing my talk only on plant genetic resources. That's a part of the agrobiodiversity because overall agrobiodiversity is a very larger area. And I will show how ICR is maintaining this one. I'll be talking primarily on plant genetic resources. And this is how we have identified ourselves how plant genetic resources will be helping in achieving the UN Sustainable Developmental Goals. Of the 17 SDGs, the six are directly dependent on plant feeding or plant genetic resources, be it no poverty, zero hunger, good health, ensuring the sustainable production, climate change, life on all, all these sustainable developmental goals depend on plant genetic resources. And that's how we are contributing these ones. And to share with you all that NBPGR has a responsibility to provide the quantitative data to the government of India for sending it to the UN to see how we are progressing. And that's how we are saying we are actually working on six of them. And of course, partnerships and goals are common to all of us, uh, whatever it is. But these are the six core areas where plant genetic resources are directly helping in achieving us those uh, sustainable developmental goals. I talked about the challenge. This was a challenge. This is a challenge. We all know the global population. And in fact, somewhere the world went wrong when our population growth from 0.6 to it went to more than two is a global one. And when we in India had somewhere the highest down 2.8% or so. And that was also, you see, probably the decades of 70s and 80s, those two decades were really the ones which took us in the wrong, wrong direction when it comes to the population growth. But this is reality. And in fact, if I give you the data what's there in India, probably the next two years will be equalizing China. By 30, 2030, we'll be surpassing them. And in fact, China may start declining its population from 2030 onwards. But we, as our demographics say, we may stabilize somewhere at 1.66 billion. But the question arises is, will Mother India be able to feed 1.66 billion people adequately? And to do that one, at the present level of our consumption, we need to increase our food grain production by at least 70%. But if we have to, and this is a fact, we know that 40% of our population is still not adequately fed. If we want to see that every person is fed completely, adequately, we probably need to double our production than what we have it here. This is a challenge for us. And we must make this challenge or keep it in front of us if we really have to work for it. Other challenge, we know the global change, the climate change is happening. 
we were really listening i am discussing this around 20 years back but now we are seeing it's happening for example in the last 23 years the 21 years are the warmest we see how we went the vertebrate population in last 40 years has gone down by 60%. More challenging is that 70% of the Earth's land is substantially degraded at the moment. These are challenges with us. This is a challenge. If we see about a century ago, we were consuming almost 7,000 plants for our food purposes. And now only three species, rice, wheat, and maize, are contributing to 70% of our, 60% of our calorie value. And just 30 species really providing 90% of the calories we are seeing from plants. Now this is a depiction what BioWest International has given, but this is the actual data. What happened since 1960, this is see, the consumption of the crops like maize, wheat, sunflower, or soybean has gone up. Look here. The consumption of millets has gone down by 63%. Consumption of pulses has gone down by 21%. This is we being primarily a vegetarian society. This is happening. This is a challenge for us. And how is it had affected? How the monoculture has affected? Now, this is the data I have given. This is the National Family Health 4 data. Of course, five is also out or partly, so I didn't use that one for a while. I was looking for a complete data to be out. See, I take an example here. Our Northwest Plain Zones, which comprises uh, here annual food grains, which is the highest record in the world. The farmers are not poor, but if you see what happened from 2006 to 2016, in Punjab, the proportion of the people who are anemic went up by 15%, making it that 53% of the population is anemic because of the iron deficiency, making it as bad as any other state. Now, why it happened? Farmers are not generally poor. The productivity is not less. Then why did it happen? One simple reason is the monoculture. 80% of our area in Punjab is under wheat and rice cultivation. People have started grow, stopped growing the minor crops, smaller vegetables, which were a part of our diet at some time. And as a result, we cannot buy everything from the market. And this is going to happen in Himachal as well soon, I tell you. When we are going exclusive for the cash crops, the farmers may get money in their pockets, but they may not be able to use that money for really having a good diet, purchasing every small thing which is required for their diets. We may be going more towards the junk food and other things. That's a challenge with us. And this is national data. This is not someone others outsiders have presented. This is our own data. In fact, 2020 data is still worse than what we had in 2016. Have a look on the challenge. This is again a very important, a very respectable journal, a respectable commission who has uh, published this data in 2019. Look in the country. This is India. The outer circle is this circle is something which is minimum required educate to food for us, optimum. It's only cereals which we are enough. All other crops, all other it articles, items are deficit. Be it fruits, be it vegetables, be it meat, be it fish, be it nuts, we are deficit in everything else. That's a challenge for us. We have to look into it, how we can really improve it. How can we change the scenario? And in fact, we are of the firm belief that to achieve this all, to meet all these challenges, germplasm will be the key and to which what NBPG is working with this one.
And this is just to give a glimpse again. We are of a firm belief that sustainable agriculture and diverse food intake, they are equally important for a healthy population. Those were the challenges, but we are a gifted country as well. Probably one of the best gifts, gifted country in the world is India. Four of the 35 biodiversity hotspots are here with us. We are center of origin of several species, crop plants, animals, fish, microbes, insects, and several of these crops have actually originated here. Are, so we are either the primary center of diversity for these crops, or after adaptation, we are the secondary center. This is something which is available with us. And it's not that this has not been used. I just gave a big slide that how, when we are talking of genetic resources, how these genetic resources can make a change. We all remember, we all have heard about dwarfing genes of wheat and rice, which brought in the green revolution. But other than that, there are not one, not two, there are dozens of examples where single genes from the cultivated germplasm or the wild species have sexually changed the crop vector. And one of the important examples globally is the Resistance to uh, this grassy stand virus. I say it's a grassy stand virus. Now this, this disease was so rampant in the eastern part of the world that it was thought probably rice may become out of cultivation in these areas. Until Dr. Kush identified a wild accession of Horizon Nevada and identified a gene that was transferred into rice and that saved the whole rice industry. That's the example. We have several genes where we went to US and US, for example, uh, industry of uh, downy mildew resistance in case of sorghum, uh, the insect resistance in sorghum, this was in, uh, uh, in cucumbers, and in fact, a gene which went to uh, Canada uh, a line called as hard red Kolkata. This went to this went to Canada and saved their wheat industry. And a recent example of a single gene. This called as what we call as submergence one gene came from a wild from a from a from a land race of rice called F13. Now, if we see the total benefit this gene has provided to the world community, it may be in billions of dollars. And India has gifted this to the whole of the world. This is what the plant genetic resources can play a role. Unfortunately, we are the signatories to all the international instrumentations, and we have the national legislations to protect those international legislations, instrumentations, and India took a leading role globally. And Dr. S. K. Sharma is a witness to that one because uh, it was during his time when he was director in BPGR, a lot of many things were going on that time, especially for this treaty on international treaty on plant genetic resources of food and agriculture. We are signatories to all of them and we have the national legislations to become this, uh, to, to protect them. So to say to the younger generations that all our plant genetic resources or animal genetic resources or other genetic resources, they are being conserved under certain national legislations and international instrumentations. And so is their sharing. And in fact, the CBD was very, very important step into this one. Prior to this, the plant genetic resources were the property of everyone. But after 1992-93, it whole changed. See, I will, I will, I will not talk this one, but I will really take to the young students to this preamble of this treaty, and I would suggest them to read it, because this preamble actually makes a basis for all of the conventions. What was more important in this one that we affirmed that the conservation of biological diversity is a common concern of humankind. All of us sitting here today, 
we are responsible we have a responsibility to conserve the biological diversity individually society nation all of us we have this responsibility and it was this basic concept that actually led to the for uh, this the cbd the second convention which is called as international treaty on plant genetic resources for food and agriculture and all over international exchange of germplasm is happening under this treaty under which 66 different crops are notified and see here again if you read the preamble of this one it has this is a preamble which is the basis of actually having the whole of the treaty if if i read this acknowledging further the plant genetic resources of food and agriculture are the raw material those are indispensable for crop genetic improvement whether by means of farmer selection classical plant breeding or modern biotechnologies and these are essential in adapting to unpredictable environments and other sorry so the question is here and no country in the world is self sufficient in plant genetic resources of all the crops so is india we are rich in some of the crops but we are not rich in other crops so we are interdependent and all these genetic resources those are being exchanged there are there are certain international instrumentations international treaties under which we are sharing our genetic resources and in the country there are different organizations different agencies different ministries which are responsible for this one for example for exchange of genetic resources across the country is the responsibility of ministry of environment and forests and va is the nodal agency for that one for the international treaty on plant genetic resources of food and crops is department of agriculture and cooperation and ministry of agriculture and cooperation for farmers rights is the ppfra which is again under dsc icar and its other institutions we are actually providing the technological backstopping to all the government agencies be it in the form of the material or be it in the form of the policies or be in the form of uh, the advice this is what the technical institutions are providing but ultimately when we have to talk to other outside the country we have to operate through our different ministries and these responsibilities are very well divided what is called as the allocation of the business to different uh, ministries and this is how I, i i really take a pride when i present this slide globally the probably icar our india is the only country in the world which has bureaus all for independent different groups of the anim, uh, organisms we have plant genetic resources bureau animal genetic resources bureau microbe genetic resources fish genetic resources all of them independently and under icr and in fact this is one of the oldest and the most robust system in the world so all our genetic resources are being conserved by these five bureaus and i will tell you that we are not acting independently we are integrated in the whole of the nation although nbpgr per se it has a main is a national institute which has a nodal responsibility we work in collaboration with other icar institutions state agricultural universities and some with the state departments as well we have 59 what we call as nationally active germplasm sites with whom we work we are not working independently stand alone we are dependent on all other institutions working in the country and that's the beauty of the uh, our national agri institution systems and for plant genetic resources we have three major activities the acquisition of the germplasm the characterization of this germplasm and the conservation and we have different means of this one i will take you few slides on each of them this is for example exploration this is how we see from 1946 to 2018 it's an old slide slightly how we have collected different genetic resources in the country 
So far, in the last 40 years, we have undertaken more than 2,700 explorations in the country and collected around 2.75 lakh accessions of the germplasm in the country. This is all indigenous. And we are actually changing over time. If you see in the last one year, I've just given the data of the 1920. Earlier, our emphasis was not on the crop wild relatives, but in the last couple of years, our emphasis has shifted to crop wild relatives. The total germplasm which we have collected last year, almost 30% of that is the crop wild relatives. And here, of course, emphasis. If you have seen the previous slide, more genetic resources are on cereals, but we see the last year is more on pulses. So this is how the things keep on changing. And we collect a very diverse germplasm or not only of the food crop, generally the cereal grains, all other crops as well. For example, this is a, a very good genetic resource of Karonda, which I identified from Fezawal. And Karonda is known to be the richest in iron. And we are a nation where 70% of our women are anemic. And we have not been able to actually use this species for our benefit. We have collected some good germplasm, which is from the Uttarakhand. Again, a wild fruit, but very rich in several other things. It's not only, this, as I told you, the uh, grains. We are looking for many other things, by the fruits, but this is one species, for example, which our colleagues identified from Andaman Nicobar. Very large leaves, and one leaf is sufficient for making one plate. And we can do with those thermocol plates or the plastic plates and use this one. We are actually looking for making, bringing this one as uh, under cultivation as well to see if we can make uh, use of this natural resource uh, for, for our food consumption and other things. So we are not working exclusively on the grains and uh, cereals and other things. We are working on everything now, all the species which are important for agrobiodiversity. We have a responsibility, that's one, because collecting the germplasm in the country, but that's not sufficient, and as told, we are dependent on many other countries as well, and every year we are introducing around 150,000 samples, to under 70,000 samples of different crops into the country. And that's our responsibility, and this is where I would like to spend a minute or so. There are several crops which for which there are several diseases or insects or weeds which are not present in our country. And based on the past risk analysis, we do not allow this to be grown directly in the field when you bring it the first time. We either ask you to grow into a containment facility, or if you don't have it, we use our own containment facility to grow it for one year and give the seeds next year. Many, many students, we are facing problems. The teachers, they, they decide their PhD problem based on material somewhere else. And when they import it, we say, no, you can, we cannot release it this year. We have to wait for one year. It becomes a problem with them. So please be patient. And this is, again, we will take a pride. If NVPGR had not taken very stringent steps in quarantine, several COVID-like pandemics might have happened in agriculture so far, which have been averted so far. And our quarantine people work, I will call religiously when it comes to quarantining. And Director IBAT is example right now. It took us them almost three months to get the seeds of the heing released. And that too conditionally that they will grow it under in a glass house first year. That's the sort of situation we actually ensure that no material goes out without any, without stringent quarantine. We are fully equipped for that one using all the modern technologies and everything for this one. And of course, once we have the germplasm, we are conserving it. And one of the most important is the XC2 conservation, where we have a gene bank which we are maintaining at minus. 18 to minus 20 degrees Celsius here at Delhi. And as of today, our total collection of seeds around 4.5, uh, 450,000 accessions, 4.5 lakhs. 
In fact, the global total collection is around 4.8 million so far, but we are the second largest gene bank in the world. There are several crops which cannot, for the seed of which cannot be stored because they lose their viability if you reduce the temperature, uh, uh, the, 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 the water content. Those have to be conserved differently, what's called as the cryoconservation. Uh, there are some species which do not produce the seeds. Those have to be conserved in C2, uh, through, through in vitro culture, tissue culture. And our these two gene banks, we are conserving almost 2,000 accessions in the tissue culture and almost 13,000 accessions uh, in the cryogene bank. This is, uh, and in fact, our cryogene bank may be the largest in the world at the moment. We are conserving a large number of species in the field gene banks, especially those which are perennial. And this is what we are doing with the, all institutions in the country including ICRs, NVPGRs on regional stations, we are maintaining different uh, number of accessions of different species based on the environmental conditions they are there. And our gene bank, this whole data is available in different forms. I will just introduce, I mean, just rush a few slides. For example, those who are interested in vegetables, you can get the vegetables. Those who are interested in uh, other crops can get data like this one. Those who are interested in oil seeds can get the data like this one. Those who are in millet, they can get the data like this one. And in fact, the collections is a state-wise collections also. So all that data will give you at the end, uh, the, the portal where we have this whole data. So it's not only the collection and the conservation, this will not be of any use until and unless we really make these available to the users and in fact, well-defined genetic resources. And as a result, NVPGR has a very important component of characterizing its genetic resources, which I will give you a few slides, but then I will tell you a bit later how we are changing our strategies so over years, we have identified a large number of genetic resources for different traits. For example, if somebody is looking for rice, you have all the resistance genes, some for wheat, all the resistance, chickpea resistance sources are available. Individual accession numbers are also available. And some of the stocks which are good, and here I'm going to really make it a bit more emphatic that NVPGR has a very specialized program on the registering of the genetic resources. I know HBT has registered a few of them in medicinal plants. Those resistant stocks, those genetic stocks which have a very unique character. They are registered and so far we have around 1500 such stocks which are registered in NBPGR. And since my topic was on nutritional security, I'm just telling you, so we have identified several lines which high protein content, for example, rice, this accession so far, we have identified the highest level of the iron, uh, this protein, 13.5%. There are other lines which have 12.5% or so, not one, not two. So if we really are interested in improving the protein content and our normal rice, which we are consuming has around seven to 7.5% 7 of the protein content, but the highest sources are 20, 12%, 13%, 14%. So if we increase the protein content of rice by one or 2%, and see how much we can contribute to this one. We know the pulses, in general, we know, we know the pulses are rich in proteins, but generally the ones which are available with us as the food crop, as the commercials, they have somewhere, let's say 20, 18, 20% protein. But we have the genetic resources, genetic stocks for almost all the species of the pulses which has something 25%, 28%, 30% protein as well. So that means there's a still possibility of improving the protein content of pulses by another five to eight percent. And that will help us a lot in really containing our protein malnourishment. See the chickpea, for example, 26%, and the ones you get in the market are 80 to 20%. So this is 6% higher than this one. And all the genetic resources, which I just mentioned, they are actually present. If you go to this site, I will leave this presentation. If you go to this site here, 
it will take you to different crops. For example, I'm taking rice. 44,000 lines of rice which have been collected indigenously, they are spotted here. That means if you click onto this spot, it will tell you which accession it is. It will give you the complete passport data. And what we are doing now, we are superimposing the climate uh, maps onto this ones, the soil maps onto this one, the altitude maps onto this one, so that if anyone is interested knowing, if uh, somebody is interested in knowing the salinity tolerant lines, we are going to superimpose a salinity map of Indian soils into this one. One can go directly into that region and the probability of having the genetic resources which are salinity tolerant in that region can be identified. So this is what's happening here. This is what the technology use is there now, which was not available to us uh, maybe 20 years or 15 years back. Now we are actually doing all those things. And this whole data is available on what we call the PGR portal. So just giving a glimpses of the variability to the younger generation, how much this is, this see, for example, barley. Barley used to be one of the important food crops for us, not too long back, maybe 50 years back or so. We do hear people saying when they're traveling long distances, they used to take sattu their barley sattu with them because they're highly energetic, slow release of the calories. And we have now all sort of barley available. So, uh, Dr. Kumar, this is where probably you can think of some technological developments here as well. We have the barley lines which are free threshing, which are purple in color, means high anthocyanin content, high protein, all those lines are available. And if we can really develop a technology of uh, having those sattus which are available in the supermarkets, I think we'll be helping our population for uh, containing the nutritional imbalances. Just a simple other division, variability of rice in one state of uh, variability of uh, uh, these uh, peas only, sorry, not peas, the beans only in Sikkim. This is one of the wild species of cucumber yams, wild fruits, all these sort of things, and very specialized traits, other things which have been identified, all these things are available at MBPGR, and these are being used as well. To share with you that uh, uh, we know that uh, India, we did realize that after Green Revolution, only few crops are becoming important. And that's where ICR had started working on what we call as potential crops. And that's the responsibility of NVPGR. We are working on 17 different crops, 16 different crops which are potential, including the buckwheat. And in fact, we are looking how the buckwheat could be made more profitable by the farmers. As you said right now, you have developed some of the products. We will be approaching you to see how these high yielding new varieties could be really popularized more with the farmers. Grain amaranthus, job steer. These are all crops which are very nutritionally important ones. And in fact, I will, I will just take have the students here. How many of you can rely, uh, recognize what, which species, sorry, which species is this one? It looks like watermelon, but it's not. This is Kalingra, a species that grows in a place where nothing else can grow, the deserts of Rajasthan. You know what's being used? Its seeds are being used in what you sometimes, you go to the market, you, you are to do this sweet, um, uh, jo hai, apne, uh, wale kehte hai, Kaju ki barfi hai. Did you ever taste kaju is there in that barfi? As you go to higher end restaurants, they say, oh, this is kaju curry. Nothing is kaju there. This is the seeds of this species, Kalingra. And I was, I was surprised to know that we are unable to meet our national requirement of this one. 50% of that we are importing from Africa. But the good thing in this one, we analyze the seeds of this one. Those seeds are still better than the kaju seeds. So I'm happy that, okay, even this is used as a substitute for coffee, it's a good one. This, this small crop, Concoda, uh, which is a, a sweet uh, karela for diabetes. And there's one small village in 
Gujarat, who have developed a very good production technology of this one in collaboration with our national partners. And they are showing that for four months, this crop is a four or five month crop. In five months, a farmer earns 1.25 lakhs per acre profit simply from this one, because this is sold in the market at 150, 200 rupees a cage. These are important crops, which are nutritionally important crops on which we are working. Having said that we have this one, but we still know there's a criticism that uh, the gene banks, which are holding a lot of germplasm, those are not being used. That's true partly, but this is uh, some data how MVPGR is sharing its genetic resources nationally. Every year, 15 to 20,000 accessions we are sharing with our, our partners here in the country, collaborators in the country. And a large number of those have been used for developing varieties. I'm just giving one of two examples, different crops. There's a material directly selected from that one and several varieties have been released in several crops. Now, realizing that still we say the genetic resources that are conserved in gene banks, they're not used to the level what we are investing in their conservation. And we recognize that. And we will work towards that only after we recognize that, yes, that's true. So we at NBPG do recognize that the usage is less than what it should be. And hence, we have to think, how can we make our gene banks more usable? And in fact, we are using technology as well. The markers have come handy to us and we are using actually the genome sequencing, GBS, other, other, other platforms for characterizing our germplasm. And this has led to actually a, a paradigm shift in the characterization and utilization of the genetic resources. Until a few years back, we were characterizing only a small part of our genetic resources every year. But we said, no, we have to characterize all the genetic resources in one go. And this is, for example, one example uh, of, of the minor pulses. The five, you know, five different minor pulses. What we are doing is we are taking a complete germplasm from the gene bank. We are planting it at three to four places in the country. All of that, characterizing it, we will be genotyping all these genetic resources by one or the other technique, be it the GBS or SNP or resequencing, depending upon the crop, depending upon the resources available in that crop, and in fact, using the technologies to identify the genes. So our objective is to really identify the germplasm with the useful traits to identify the markers which are linked to this one so that we give a complete package to the breeders. Hey, yes, this is a genetic resource. The trait you are looking for, this is the trait, this is the line, and this is the marker that's available with that one you can use for this one. That is what we are actually looking. And fortunately, DBT has come forward. And in fact, uh, it was because of COVID, we are a little bit slow, but until last year, we got a funding of around 280 crores for 15 different crops to work on to this, this sort of model. And for example, here, we have the cowpea 3,700 accessions. We have the green gram 4,100 accessions, black gram 2,200 accessions, mountain bean, horse gram, all of them, and see they're all planted in one go at one place at least two locations. Have a look at the variability of this one. And we are actually genotyping all of them. I don't have a sufficient data to share because it's a larger projects. In fact, even the private companies are not sufficient to give you the data in short time. They're taking a lot of time for that one. We don't want to invest into the big machines, but we are actually Maybe if I, I present it that day, uh, a year later, we will have a lot of data, genotypic data for all these ones where we will be generating cores, we'll be mapping genes of all these crops. And the crops see, for example, see the variability in one of the important crops in system. Complete, we are planting, see the variability coming into this one. 
and we are looking on this graph it has two major issues file id which is a mycoplasma based resist, uh, disease devastating disease and we don't have any source of resistance so we have planted this germplasm all over germplasm across the country at three locations three hot spots and we have screened we have identified few lines which are showing some level of tolerance to the uh, to the mycoplasma to the file id likewise water logging is a major issue if water becomes stagnant for 24 hours and this crop is completely lost so we screened this complete germplasm for water logging and see we identified some lines this is a dead line this is dying this is a normal line which is completely there and we have identified 42 accessions which we are actually repeating onto this one so what will happen in two years time, we'll give a complete package to be done. Okay, this is a line which has a tolerance to water logging. And these are the genes which may be responsible for this water logging, which you can use as markers for markers selection. And all others who are working on the basic sciences, they can do all these kind of things. For this so in fact, this, this kind of work we are doing with 15 different crops and more than 80 or 90 different institutions in the country are involved into this one. And this is what I suggested to the National Medicinal Plant Board, that for some of the medicinal plants which are economically important, most important in the country, we should characterize them like that one. We should collect the germplasm data and do it. Fortunately, the CEO of National Medicinal Plant Board is very active, Dr. Shastri. We are having good collaborations and in fact, he has requested a space in our National Gene Bank, which has been provided. We have signed an MOU with them as well. And all the genetic resources, seed based, which they are collecting, they can be deposited here. And in fact, this sort of program, the larger scale programs are required for the medicinal plants as well. To know the ones which are having the highest levels of the active ingredients, which we are looking for. To identify genes which are associated with those traits. That's one area probably we could be looking for a collaboration with institutes like IIPT, Palampur, or other uh, institutes which are working for the medicinal plants as well. Not only medicine of other aromatic plants as well in this case. To conclude my topic, why how we look for the future? Yes, new collections. This will continue because never will be it's, it's a never ending process we'll keep on continuing collecting uh, new genetic resources we are emphasizing on analyzing our collections in the gene bank and we are emphasizing on the plant utilization we are looking for the ways for improving or enhancing our in situ conservation capacities in the native agroecosystems and especially for the crop wild relatives this is very important for us. We have initiated some programs. They are at a very uh, smaller scale at the moment because they are difficult. A uh, large number of the organizations are involved into this one, but we are doing their one. We are looking for also the garden plot park gene banks, experimental introductions. For example, we do not have any of the wild species of weed growing in India. But the areas, in Lahal Spiti, mimic the areas where these wild species occur naturally in Afghanistan or in Iran or Iraq or the, or the, 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 the crescent. So we are actually thinking of can we really bring these species, have the man-made parks where these could be grown under natural conditions. This is another area where we are looking forward in our future. But this one, I, I thank uh, all my colleagues from NBPGR, whose data, whose photographs I'm using for these presentations, and thanks to all of them, it's a collective presentation of NBPGR. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Singh. I think it has been an eye-opening seminar, and uh, several of our colleagues and our students, they must have immensely benefited. And uh, I see a lot of uh, collaborative opportunities actually between uh, IHBT and the NBPGR. I see several points of collaboration, Dr. Sir. I think it's time that, you know, had it been a real meeting, 
rather than virtual we could have discussed at least few programs of common interest bardly you identified yourself and let me tell you that uh, we are working on this sattu type of thing you know all our protein powder are pulse based and we can move forward and uh, what you mentioned also about germplasm uh, characterization for specific traits for medicinal aromatic plants and so many other things actually you mentioned and uh, uh, i think a lot of opportunity exists and we will even after this talk that we will be in discussion with each other and let's see if some common things can be done and we can move forward and uh, like you also mentioned something about uh, centers for cultivation of some of the plants for which you need some unique areas uh, that could also be thought of so i find lot many things where we can really work together for value addition and ensuring that we save our biodiversity certainly i think that would be at the back of our mind <laughs> we will take care of that so thank you so much dad sir and uh, uh, with such a fantastic presentation now i request professor sharma ji uh, to give his uh, presidential address please thank you very much uh, dr sanjay kumar ji uh, dr kuldeep singh Directly of the your video national. is off. If you can switch on your video, no, it is uh, on. I, that, that's how you may unshare your slide. Maybe uh, you have unshared yeah. the slide. No, I can see you. I can see your uh, picture. Uh, that's why. Yeah, I want to share my slide. Yeah. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, you are okay. audible, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sanjay Kumar Ji. Uh, Dr. Kuldeep Singh, Director of the National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, who is the chief guest and also uh, speaker uh, of the today, uh, the National Technology Day. Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Director of the Institute, scientists and students, including other staff of the Institute, friends, representing the press and media. Matter of great. That's how we are losing uh, your voice. Knowledge. That's how we are losing your voice. maybe you can switch off your camera then you can speak i think we are losing your voice that's for some reason this technology professor kuldeep singh ji i think you are also not receiving his voice am i right yes sir i think uh, there is some some problem in the connectivity yeah yeah Uh, सर आप अपना अगर वीडियो बंद करके शुरू करें तो शायद मेरे ख्याल आवाज आपकी आवाज आ नहीं रही है व्हाट आई शुड डू सर या या सर आप अगर दोबारा एंटर कर जाएं सर एक बार एग्जिट करके प्रॉब्लम समटाइम दैट हेल्प्स ना क्योंकि सर आवाज नहीं आ रही सर आपकी Um, am I audible now? Uh, uh, बहुत क्लियर नहीं है सर अभी भी आवाज आई थिंक शुड नॉट बी ओके जी ट्राई टू मूव टू सम
एक बार मैं इनको कॉल कर I think we are trying to fix up that sir. I think uh, our person is in contact with Professor Sharma. Uh, they are trying to figure it out. They are trying to figure it out. Sometimes this does happen. So this is one of the <laughs> limitation of these technologies. <laughs> Hello. Uh, bandwidth uh, is not that high across the country at the moment. Yes. Uh, Uh, this is what we are feeling, and imagine the students uh, who are still who are being taught online. That's and, right. And, and and the village. Yes. How do we expect them that okay, we are reaching everyone, which is not yes. true. Yes. Not true. We still need uh, it's a good development, but still. Yeah. Still need. <laughs> That's true. I think. Keeping in view the size of this nation. the strength of the servers strength of the signal all these things needs immense improvement that's and you know like for example when today you were showing your data that from 7000 uh, diversity region we have came down to only three major species i think it will be alarming for our student also that what are we doing and uh, how our eating habits have gone down drastically that we just rely on these three crops at one time you know so many crops used to be there and uh, i think something needs uh, something serious has gone down 
True, true. I mean, that's why probably when UN has realized that uh, these food systems uh, need to be really uh, discussed. Yes. Uh, and uh, too much of commercialization, everything. Yes. Uh, is there. And, and we see the nutritional status of our population is not very, uh, say, Comfortable. So rich in iron. Right? And uh, at one time, we always used to have karonga in our preparation. That used to be part of our diet. Right. And nowadays, if you ask anybody to have karonga, I think um, they they probably may not even know what karonga looks like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably where... Uh, uh, commercialization, other things, uh, we need some, some. Then we have this responsibility of uh, uh, these uh, potential crops. Yes. And yes. under severe yes. pressure yes. from our director general, yes. that we really need to bring them to the Hello. mainstream. Welcome, sir. Yes. Welcome, sir. I think Professor Sharma is. Hello. Uh, can you, sir? Welcome, Am I sir. audible now? Very well, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Audible as well as visible, sir. Maybe, sir, you can switch Hi. off the camera, then probably okay, thank you so much. Bandwidth, will, bandwidth will be adjusted, sir. Probably if you can switch yes. off the camera, then you can just speak. Uh, that would be better. Uh, I'm doing that. I'm doing Uh Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the little trouble. Uh, uh, as I said, that uh, I'm very happy to be a part of the National Technology Day celebrations, which is being organized by the Institute. I congratulate uh, all the all of you on this National Technology Day. Uh, as I said, that uh, this Technology Day is celebrated to commemorate the uh, anniversary of the testing of the nuclear missile at Pokhran on 11th May 1998, and uh, the former Prime Minister Atal Bihari Bajpayee named 11th May as the National Technology Day and it is celebrated every year since then. Besides some other technological advancements that took place on that day was, first indigenous aircraft, Hansa 3 was flown in Bengaluru, and also the test firing of the Trishul missile was also undertaken. This technology Development Board, autonomous body of the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India is the nodal agency for the celebration of the day. And also on this day, the individual scientists who have made outstanding contribution to science, technology, innovation are honored on this day. Technology plays a very important role in the national development. It helps in wealth creation improving the quality of life, economic growth, transformation in this society. It has played a very key role in all these sectors or in different walks of life, the industry, the agriculture, the medicine, the engineering, the space, the atomic energy and so on. Today we are celebrating the National Technology Day through a digital platform without getting assembled in the auditorium is an example of the use of this technology to keep the activities going on even during the current pandemics. The Institute of Himalayan Biosource Technology has been in the forefront in the development and population of the technologies having a relevance to the society. As the Honorable Director has mentioned that uh, 117 MAUs have been signed and the technologies relating to various areas such as uh, cultivation of floricultural crops, popularizing stevia, bamboo cultivation, reviving kangra tea, medicinal aromatic plants had been uh, commercialized. In addition to it, the Institute has developed technologies for catalyzing industrial growth, value added foods and nutraceuticals. The Institute has transferred many technologies to various entrepreneurs, 
for further commercialization. Above all, the Institute is also very active in the area of basic and strategic research leading to the development of various products and processes. The IHF team under the dynamic leadership of the director deserves appreciation and accolades for their uh, accomplishments. The director has already given the details of the technologies developed. In addition to it, the Institute is very actively involved in serving the people in the difficult times of the, uh, uh, this pandemics. We just heard a very interesting, very informative and very illuminating talk from Dr. Kuldeep Singh. As it has been said that uh, he is steering the plant genetic resource management program of the country and is representing the country at many national and international fora and putting forth the Indian position on many trivial issues relating to access and benefit sharing, popularly called as ABS, digital sequence information, plant genetic resources, gene banks, PGR databases, biodiversity, and so on and so uh, And recently, he has also taken the initiative of establishment of a safety duplicate gene bank in the Himalayas, uh, which is being uh, considered by the ICR. I have had the privilege of getting associated with the Bureau in one or the other capacity to participate in their meetings, programs, brainstorming, and it has been a great experience and a learning process by participating in such meetings. The PGR management, as many would think, is not merely collection, conservation, and distribution of the germplasm. Indeed, it is much more than that. The present day PGR management is a science which makes use of disciplines like informatics, biotechnology, genomics, bioprospecting, feed, seed physiology, low temperature biology, etc. There could not have been a better person than Dr. Kuldeep Singh to speak on this very important topic. And also, there would have there would not have been a better topic on which Dr. Kuldeep Singh spoke, which has a great relevance uh, to the sustainable food security and nutritional security. Besides, the biodiversity or the agrobiodiversity is central to the accomplishment of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, IG targets of the CBD and the national biodiversity targets of the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. As Dr. Kuldeep Singh mentioned that India is a very rich country as far as the bioresources are concerned. Uh, he mentioned that uh, India is one of the eighth Babylonian center of origin of crops, one twelfth mega biodiversity centers and also one of the 17th mega biodiversity nation. Besides the four hotspots of diversity out of 36 are in India, uh, which are Himalayas, Western Ghats, indo burma region, Sunderland, that also include our Nicobar Islands. More than 800 species of crow wild relatives are found in the country and also more than 10,000 plant species with PGR importance are available in the country. So the country uh, is extremely rich, not only in the plant genetic resources, as you mentioned, but also in the animal genetic resources. There are around 200 breeds of cattle, buffalo, goat, sheep, horses, ponies, camel, pig, donkey, yak, chicken, and 
duck and geese. Likewise, India is also very rich in the fish genetic resources. Around 3,200 fish species are available in the country, which is around 10% of the global fish species which have been recorded. The country is also very rich in the insect species. Insects are very important. They contribute the largest component in the biosources. And there are around 60,000 insect species in the country. And unfortunately, these insect species are very useful, many of them, and they have been not uh, uh, studied. But uh, it's very sad that countries, it has been seen that the countries of which rich in bioresources are poor countries. It is the irony and vice versa. For example, in Europe, there are only four hotspots of diversity in the Europe, equal to the hotspots of diversity in India. They are all rich countries. It is because of the fact that those countries have technology and they have made use of the technology to convert bioresources into wealth. And therefore, uh, we can well realize that what is the importance of technology. Coming to the <clears throat> uh, importance of biodiversity, biodiversity, including agrobiodiversity, is extremely important for the sustainable development and human well-being. As Dr. Kuldeep Singh mentioned that it is it underpins the provisions of food, fiber, water, mitigates the effect of climate change, soil erosion, sports, human health, and provides livelihood to a large number of people. It is estimated that globally, 2.6 billion people draw their livelihood from agriculture, either directly or indirectly. And 3 billion people depend upon the marine and coastal biodiversity for their livelihood and about 1.6 billion people depend upon forest and non-timber forest products. So we can see uh, the importance of biodiversity. The speaker also, uh, Dr. Kuldev Singh also mentioned that in realizing the importance of biodiversity, the government of India has taken many initiatives. The country has signed many treaties, agreements, conventions, both before the CBD came into being in 1992 and also after the CBD came into being. For example, in the pre-CBD era, countries party to the International Union for Conservation of Nature, a Ramsar Convention which deals with the wetlands, World Heritage Convention, and also party to the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Fauna and Flora. The country very actively participated in the and became party to CBD. In fact, India was the first few countries to become a party of CBD. It is also signed a treaty, what we call as International Treaty for Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, popularly known as FAO Treaty, and the Katahin Protocol of, for, of Biosafety, and the latest being the Nagoya Protocol. The government of India has also put in place various mechanisms to have compliance with these international treaties and conventions. These are BDA, the Biodiversity Act, a very important act of 2001, Protection of Plant Varieties and Farmers' Right Act of 2002, the Plant Quarantine Order of 2003, and many others. Dr. Kudip Singh has also mentioned that biodiversity is central to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Addressing the biodiversity loss, its issues and concern, 
we can take care of SDG 1, that is no poverty, development goal 2, zero hunger, development goal 3, good health, goal 5, gender equality, good, goal 12, sustainable production, goal 13, climate action, and the important goal 15, life out land, and also the last goal that is 17, partnership among institutions. So we can see that biodiversity has a very close linkage with these eight important sustainable goals. And also the remaining nine SDGs are also addressed indirectly by these eight sustainable development goals. In view of it, we can say that biodiversity is central or at the heart of achieving the all United States uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. To uh, support it, recently analysis was undertaken by the CBD, FAO, United Nations Environment and the Development Program, and it was found that supporting or solving issues and concerns about the loss of biodiversity can help in fulfillment of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are to be reviewed in 2030. And we are only left with nine or 10 years uh, to review them. And it has been found that uh, uh, many countries are lagging behind and they are at the different levels of achieving these uh, goals. Besides, the CBD strategic plan for biodiversity, its five goals and 20 IG targets will also be addressed if we are addressing these issues. Likewise, looking at the concerns of biodiversity loss, uh, we can also, to a greater extent, can achieve the 12 national biodiversity targets of the Ministry of Environment, Forest, and the Climate Change. So the agrobiodiversity and particularly biodiversity loss, which is happening, uh, I think if we are able to curtail or if we are able to stop this loss, we would be able to achieve most of the sustainable development goals and most of the targets of CBD and also the targets of the government of India as far as the biodiversity is concerned. <laughs> The pandemic that we are facing today has an effect on biodiversity programs. The current COVID-19 pandemic has an adverse impact on many national, international meeting programs, conferences related to biodiversity. For example, the Conference of Parties 15 of CBD was to be held in China last year, but it could not be held, and it has been postponed to the current year. Likewise, COP26 of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCC, which was to be held last year, has also been postponed. Many international, national meetings, programs, projects have been delayed, and uh, even Dr. Kuldeep Singh mentioned the second international conference on agrobiodiversity, which was to be held in Rome during the current year, I do not know uh, how it will be held. Maybe it is postponed or it is held through a virtual mode. And therefore, the current pandemic has a serious impact on the poverty, hunger, health, employment, and the growth. Many researchers feel that COVID-19 pandemic is the result of the neglected biodiversity and ecosystem services. Both vaccines and immunity are being advocated as a solution to avoid infection. Ayurveda, the Indian system of medicines, lay emphasis on promotion of health concept by strengthening the host defense system and hence getting resistance against different diseases. 
herbal drugs are known to possess excellent immunomodulatory properties. This concept is known as Rasayana in Ayurveda and known to use around 700 plant species besides many species of fruits, vegetables, nuts also increase the immunity and are being consumed since time memorial. These are very much part of the biodiversity or the agrobiodiversity. The current pandemic has renewed the interest of the government of India in one health approach, which is expected to launch national mission on biodiversity and human well-being under the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. National Biodiversity Authority would be the nodal agency. The mission will link the biodiversity science with people's prosperity. It also aims at realizing the sustainable development goals to create solutions for challenges that we are facing in the area of agriculture, health, climate change, and so on. The mission envisages that all stakeholders, both in the public and private sector, will work together. The mission will also create a cadre of biodiversity science professionals who would help in the sustainable use of biodiversity. And it will also help in the developing biodiversity as a science, as a discipline in the country. Finally, I would like to mention that the theme of the International Day for Biodiversity 2020, which was held on May 22nd, was our solutions are in nature. Hence, there is a need to refocus on nature-based solutions to conserve, restore, and maintain natural ecosystems and the biodiversity. And uh, in the end, I'd like to say <coughs> that the Technology Day is a day which reminds us that how science, technology, and innovation can bring prosperity, can create wealth, can create employment and growth in the country and this requires to be addressed or this is required to be given importance in the end i congratulate the speaker dr kuldeep singh for a very excellent talk which you all listened it has been a very educating talk to all of us where he mentioned that how agrobiodiversity can address important issues of food and nutritional security. And he also demonstrated that the science of PGR management involves the use of large number of disciplines and requires the efforts of all sectors. I also congratulate the director for organizing the National Technology Day during the current pandemic. And I thank the director and the institute for giving me an opportunity to share my some of the thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, sir, I would say that it would not have been anybody better than both of you on this technology day for an institute like ours, which works on bioresources bio of the Himalayas. And so many diverse issues you have raised, so many things you have educated us. I'm sure that I was also ignorant on several of these issues. And I'm sure that uh, today is the start day when uh, CSIR, IHBT and uh, ICR, NBPGR can forge into some sort of collaboration further. Although, you know, using Hing and other examples, we were working together, but probably this will be further path for further progress and further working together. Thank you so much, sir. And also you, the sir. way you have summarized the importance of technology and biodiversity. I think uh, uh, that, that will show us again a very new path 
how we should sustainably use biodiversity and create wealth and not only create wealth but do the welfare of the society and uh, we will take it sir very seriously these issues and i am sure you are our all rc member also there you will guide us you will suggest us and we will act accordingly thank you so much sir and thank now you. i hand over the stage to kuldeep for taking it further thank you sir it is time for vote of thanks it is my honor and privilege to propose a formal vote of thanks on this occasion first and foremost we are highly privileged to have with us officer kuldeep singh director icr ndpcr and chief guest of the today's function thank you very much sir for taking out time from your busy schedule and delivering the national technology day lecture on conservation of agro biodiversity for ensuring food and nutritional security in india indeed it was a very interesting and informative lecture and uh, thank you for guiding us on the challenges and how agro biodiversity can effectively be conserved and enhanced certainly conserving agro biodiversity is very important and vital for the future generations i strongly believe that uh, our scientists young scholars staff and are Im immensely benefited from your one year thought in this topic thank you very much sir a special thanks to professor s k sharma honorary professor and former vc csk hpk v palampur and former director of icr and vpgr for presiding over the function sir your presence on this day is a guiding force and motivation for all of us your able guidance has always always enriched us thank you very much for your word of advice and gracious presence sir i would also like to thank our directors for the constant motivation and guidance we are highly thankful for the gracious presence of academicians and guests from the different universities institutions organizations and associations we thank our current and former rc members and our our former colleagues who joined in this program thanks are due to press and media for their presence and coverage of the national technology day celebration contribution of all the icbt staff who were actively involved to make various arrangements for today's function are greatly acknowledged thank you for all the audience scientists technical staff and scholars of csrr icbt in the end i thank one and all for their support and encouragement for making this function a successful event thank you very much now i request all of you to rise for the national anthem please Shiva.